Uh, good evening again. Thank you and welcome uh, to the historical Oriental Hall of the American University in Cairo. We are very pleased today to uh, host uh, Professor Philippe Van Paris uh, uh, from Belgium to give us today's talk about universal basic income. Um, uh, I would like to take a couple of minutes first to introduce to you uh, the alternative policy project uh, that is hosted by the American University in Cairo. Uh, but before we start, I will kindly ask you to please turn off your phones and the ringers so that the uh, conversation is not interrupted. Thank you very much. Um, the Alternative Policy Solution Project is a non-partisan uh, policy uh, uh, research project at the American University in Cairo. It aims at uh, producing evidence-based uh, policy papers that tackle uh, and address and analyze the uh, pressing problems uh, of Egypt. Uh, our approach, we differentiate ourselves from the different research centers uh, and think tanks in Egypt by adopting uh, a, a process that is uh, rigorous and evidence-based in developing our um, research policies. Uh, we also uh, uh, adopt uh, a particip participatory approach to develop our uh, uh, papers. Uh, in all the papers we have developed uh, and currently developing, uh, we engage all the stakeholders that are uh, affected, uh, related uh, to the policies that we propose. Uh, we also uh, look at the process of growth as a process that entails also some uh, and important element, which is social justice. So in all our elements, uh, all our uh, products, whether it's uh, a policy paper or a policy brief or a background paper, um, we uh, look at the angle of uh, social justice in all the problems that are facing Egypt. Uh, so today's uh, talk is one of the series of different talks that we have been uh, holding. Uh, we've discussed uh, in the same room uh, uh, the Egyptian taxation system uh, and today we look at the aspect of social policy, one important aspect of social policy and how we tackle uh, this as uh, aspect. One of the new innovative ideas uh, in today's global economy is the issue of unconditional uh, transfer un or um, universal basic income. So. Uh, we, we today have the authority uh, uh, in this uh, domain. Uh, he's our special guest. We've been uh, discussing your visit since uh, almost a year now. And we're very happy that you uh, took out of your uh, very busy schedule to uh, come and visit us uh, and uh, bring this discussion today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, uh, present uh, the very lengthy uh, biography uh, um, that doesn't give you right, but uh, um, you, uh, Professor Van Paris is um, a, a professor at the University of Louvain in Belgium. Uh, he is associated with many universities, one of them is Harvard and Oxford and Berkeley, and um, he is the founder of the Basic Income Earth Network that uh, uh, obviously is interested in uh, studying the basic income uh, proposition. He has many, many books uh, on the topic, uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, we are very happy to have him to discuss this. Um, so uh, his latest book is Basic Income, a Radical Proposal for a Free Society and a Sane Economy, uh, and it's published by the Harvard University Press and has been already translated into a, a handful of languages. Uh, hopefully we'll get someone to translate into Arabic uh, soon. Um, so without further ado, uh, uh, I will leave it to Professor Van Parish to uh, give his talk. His talk will be for around 30 minutes. And then uh, the second hour of today's uh, lecture will be given to a question uh, from the audience. So please uh, um, join me in welcome Professor Van Paris in today's day. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know what uh, the lecturers usually say at uh, the beginning of their lecture. They say they are extremely pleased and honored to be invited. But in this case, 
I'm really particularly pleased to be invited within the framework of the project that has just been described, because it's really part of my life commitment to invite people to think about the future, to think about it in the light of what is required by social justice, but at the same time in a no-nonsense, evidence-based way. And so there, that's why I'm particularly uh, pleased to be able to contribute modestly to this. I say modestly because you can't expect from a foreigner like me, let alone from just a Belgian, not even an American, to, can, to come and tell you what's good for Egypt. You are far better qualified to say what's good for Egypt. But, uh, of course, in each of our countries, it is often useful to listen to what is being uh, proposed, what is being discussed, what is being tried in other countries in the world, not to transpose it in a simplistic way, but in order to simply learn from other people's imagination, from other people's uh, successes, and from other people's mistakes. So let me start by telling you how the idea of a universal basic income, of an unconditional basic income, came to me a very long time ago, before many of you were born. Uh, this was uh, in the winter of 1982. And an idea came to me which initially I thought would only be relevant to developed countries. And I'll tell you later that um, I'll tell you in a minute uh, why then it's only later that I realized that it had also some relevance for develop, uh, developing countries. The uh, two reasons that make me come to the idea of, a, of an unconditional basic income are the following. The first one is really specific to developing to developed countries and uh, in particular European countries at the time. In the early 80s we had a, a high level of unemployment and people on the right and on the left were all saying well to solve this problem of unemployment what we need is growth, growth, growth. It's growth that will create employment. Of course there is productivity growth which means that you, you need less people to produce a car. But if you need uh, only uh, two people instead of four to produce a car, then you should just produce twice as many cars and the problem will be solved. But this was already about 10 years after the alarm call of the Club of Rome, uh, limits to growth, that, says, that said, be careful, certainly in the rich countries, if you keep going like that, uh, producing, consuming ever more, uh, thinking also about the need to generalize that, to share this standard of living in the whole world, we are going against the wall. This is not going to be possible. And so the first reason, the first path that took me to the idea of the unconditional basic income was the following. It said, well, we want everyone who wants to work to find a job. But why don't we try something else, something other than growth, and just say, well, we give an unconditional basic income, which means that some people who work too much will be able to reduce their working time or have a break, and the people who are excluded from work will be able to have an access to a job, in part because uh, some of the jobs will have been relinquished by the people who uh, uh, took advantage of the possibility of reducing their working time or of interrupting it, and in part because a, an unconditional basic income is something you can combine with low, page work, uh, low paid work without losing the benefit uh, which is given to you. So that was the first path that took me there, and of course far more people today in uh, the developed world have come to the same idea because since then we've discovered something else which is climate change which completely unknown at the time in the, the early 1980s and of course we've had growth huh? in compared to the early 80s even more compared to the 60s huh? 
we've had a massive growth. GDP per capita is much higher than in the golden 60s today in the developed countries, uh, uh, two to three times more uh, depending on the country. And yet we have the same sort of, if not more, a higher rate of unemployment, a higher rate of precariousness than we had at the time. That's the first uh, path that led me to that idea, which I thought and still think today is really uh, restricted in its relevance to uh, developed countries uh, in which you have, in which most of the employment is in the formal sector and in which therefore there is a clear notion of involuntary unemployment that is um, uh, also covered by social insurance. And there was then a second idea, a uh, second path that led me uh, to the idea of a, an unconditional basic income, and that is as relevant to this country, to any country in the world, as uh, it was at the time, in my view, uh, to, um, the, to Western Europe. And that second uh, path, the second conviction that led me to it, is that we absolutely need, and today even more than then, an alternative vision of the future um, uh, uh, that uh, would provide uh, a real option, a real vision for the future, different from the two, from two other utopias, you could say, the neoliberal utopia of total submission uh, to the market and the old socialist utopia of total submission to the state. We need something else, and this something else, in my view, could have as a central element this unconditional basic income, the possibility for everyone uh, to choose freely uh, the sort of life he or she uh, wants to live. Mm. Basic income on its own wouldn't do that, but it would be a central ingredient, central ingredient of a powerful alternative to both neoliberalism and old socialism. So, um, I propose that in the early 80s, and then uh, I soon realized that um, a bit uh, modestly a la Karl Marx, in order for an idea to make progress, you need a doctrine and you need a movement. And uh, so I realized that I think the strongest and the most emotional argument against basic income was not of an administrative uh, sort, of a financial sort, of an economic sort, it was uh, moral objection. Can you give unconditionally to everyone an income without a counterpart? Mm. Of course, it's a way of empowering people, but can you do that? And so I uh, published now about 20 years ago uh, uh, with Oxford University Press at the time a book called uh, Real Freedom for All, What, If Anything, Can Justify Capitalism that claims to provide a philosophical justification for an unconditional basic income. But you don't only need a, a philosophy to get an idea moving, you also need a movement. And in uh, 1986, in, um, uh, I gathered in Louvain-la-Neuve, my university town, all the people, the few people who I had managed to locate at the time and who were defending a similar idea or were defending that idea. And that's when we created the Basic Income European Network, gathering a number of people in a number of countries, uh, mostly academics, but also activists, trade union people, uh, defending uh, that idea, interested in that idea, and then also uh, for many of, of them advocating that idea. We started having congresses uh, every two years, but one weird thing uh, happened then, which is from Congress to Congress, there were more and more people not only from outside Europe coming, but from outside the developed world. And that uh, perplexed me. I thought this was an idea that could only be relevant in countries with a developed welfare state, uh, in countries that slowly realized the perverse effects of the existing welfare state, the existing uh, form of uh, social protection that uh, was focused on the poor, people without an income, or people who, are, who were uh, uh, involuntarily unemployed. And therefore, it's a sort of welfare state that encourages, rewards, in a way, passivity, uh, rather than uh, sort of make, liberating people, emancipating people. So I thought 
that this idea would only be relevant for the developed countries, but then you had more and more uh, people from outside Europe. And then there was growing pressure, especially from a Brazilian senator at the time, and I'll return to him in a moment, uh, who had joined uh, the uh, movement, the network uh, in the 1990s. Uh, there was increasing pressure to say, why don't we make it a worldwide network so that uh, people in other uh, countries, also less developed countries, could be evolved. I was very reluctant to do so because I thought, well, this in those countries, it's really not immediately relevant. And then something happened that really convinced me. That is that this uh, senator had uh, started uh, um, campaigning in his own country. And I was invited in 2004 to the signing into law of a, um, of a um, sort of a proposal that had been made by the senator, uh, approved by the two chambers of the Brazilian uh, Congress, and then signed by Lula when I was there in January 2004, uh, that uh, said Article 1, uh, Brazil is introducing an unconditional basic income for all Brazilians and uh, uh, permanent residents. And, um, but Brazil is going to introduce that uh, gradually, starting with the neediest. So it was really not an unconditional basic income, which would be an income given unconditionally to every citizen, because it said that it started in a particular way. And this sort of was the blow that, uh, say, that uh, led me to say, OK, we can uh, turn that into a worldwide network. And indeed, uh, uh, for example, we, then we had the following uh, uh, Congress was held in Africa, in Cape Town in 2006. And uh, we've had uh, other Congresses uh, in, uh, outside of uh, Europe uh, since. Uh, indeed, the next Congress now in 2019 will be in India, in uh, Hyderabad. So, but what is it that... Um, makes, after all, a basic income, an unconditional basic in, um, income relevant to developing countries, including potentially Egypt. Hmm? Because in terms of GDP per capita, income per capita, uh, Egypt is at about the same level as South Africa, and it is somewhat below Brazil, but not that much uh, below Brazil, and it is, of course, far above uh, India. So how come... Uh, this idea can be relevant in the uh, in a context of a developing country. Um, I shall always remember when we had this uh, congress in Cape Town. One of my uh, uh, South African colleagues, an economist, came to me and uh, said, uh, "Told me, you know, Philip, you are just as arrogant as Karl Marx, because Karl Marx thought that uh, the socialist revolution." could only happen in a highly industrialized country, hmm? in Germany, in England, in Belgium, in France. And then it happened in Russia. It happened in China, not where you would expect. You'll see, he told me, basic income will not be introduced first in, uh, in uh, Belgium, in, in Europe, or in the United States. It will be introduced first in South Africa. Hmm? And why? And that's what I want uh, to turn to, and I'll have uh, questions to ask you about uh, this uh, in a minute. He said, well, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, or even in the United States, but less generously in the United States, what do you do in order to help the poor? Huh? Well, something called social assistance goes back to the beginning of the 16th century, in Europe, what, but then was later uh, systematized. It was also adjusted, taking the existence of powerful, in some countries, of powerful social insurance systems into account. But you have now, in many European countries, some sort of conditional uh, guaranteed minimum income system. But that is means-tested. That means every household that has an income below a certain level uh, receives a benefit so that they are lifted beyond some more or less arbitrarily defined threshold of poverty. And that's what you have in, 
England, in Germany, uh, in, in France, it has uh, uh, different names in Scandinavian countries, uh, earlier than elsewhere in, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. Uh, in Italy, it has just been introduced, and the new government claims that it's going to lift considerably at that level. So anyway, you have a system and where, and which is a guaranteed, a, a conditional guaranteed minimum income system where you identify the poor households, income beyond, below a certain level, and then you make up the difference with the threshold by giving uh, to these people uh, what the, the, the difference. Mm? So that they are lifted out of that more or less arbitrarily defined poverty level. Okay. That's what you have in, uh, in Europe. But, said my uh, uh, economics colleague uh, in South Africa, how can you apply that in South Africa where the most of the economy is informal? How are you going to identify the poor? And, I, um, uh, and that is uh, then the Second, I mean, the, the reason why uh, basic income, after all, uh, has been defended as being particularly relevant in developing countries, defined as countries in which the informal sector is very large. Uh, so, if I go back to my, the two reasons I gave uh, at the very beginning uh, of my little talk, uh, the two reasons I gave for uh, my believing in the relevance of basic income in the context of developing countries, uh, of developed countries, I said, it's the idea of providing a vision of the future that would be a real alternative to old socialism and uh, neoliberalism. That reason uh, also is also uh, relevant in uh, the context of developing countries. But the other reason I gave is not, but there is a specific reason in developing countries, which is what I just said, the, the importance of the informal sector, which makes a means test, uh, uh, an income test, extremely difficult uh, to implement. I then, uh, and, and before asking uh, you the question, uh, I want to ask you, and I would like to be enlightened on that, um, I'll ask you a question about three ways of trying to solve that problem, uh, of trying to have a form of assistance uh, to the poor that would work in the context of a large, um, of a large informal economy. And, um, and I ask you um, to reflect on the three sorts of answers that have been given to that question, which uh, could be called the Brazilian uh, solution, the, uh, the Mexican solution, and then what would be the uh, unconditional basic income uh, solution. Back to Brazil, then first, in fact, uh, with this Brazilian senator called uh, Eduardo Suplicy, I went to see uh, uh, President Cardoso, who was uh, the president of Brazil before Lula. Mm? So, was uh, in charge for eight years, he had two mandates. And um, uh, Eduardo Suplicy was the first uh, senator elected and the only senator for a while uh, elected for the PT, uh, Lula's uh, party, but he was a professor of economics at the same institution as uh, Cardoso, and he obtained uh, an audience, uh, a meeting with President uh, Cardoso, uh, in order to uh, discuss moves, and he took me along, moves towards uh, what he believed in, uh, an unconditional basic income. Um, we were then, that was in probably about 2002, um, at the time there were in a number of municipalities in Brazil, I repeat, Brazil is somewhat richer than Egypt, but not very much per capita, uh, bigger population, about double the population of, uh, of Egypt. Um, there were at the time in a number of municipalities, but the relatively rich, all relatively rich municipalities, uh, there was a form of guaranteed minimum income system, means tested, a bit similar to what exists in Europe, limited to families with children. Uh, you had that in the city of Campinas, uh, you had that in the federal district of uh, Brasilia, with uh, the governor at the time was the future minister, uh, Christophe Buarque. And uh, 
who we also went to see. But the big problem with these municipal experiments, uh, well, there were two big problems. Uh, the first one is uh, that uh, in order to prevent what you could call opportunistic immigration of the poor coming from uh, other areas, there was a very long waiting period. Uh, if you moved into Brasilia and you were poor, it's only after 10 years that you were entitled to these benefits hmm, that were for the, all the poor people in Brasilia who had been living there for long enough. But you had to wait for 10 years. The second big problem is that only the richer municipalities could afford this system. And so we tried to convince uh, Cardoso successfully to uh, involve the federal level, so the national level, in at least co-funding uh, these uh, municipal experiments. This uh, would have the advantage of reducing the pressure if it's financed at least in part or in large part by the federal level. Uh, then you can say, well, uh, and it's done everywhere, then there is no problem of waiting period, period anymore, no? or it's far less serious, one. And two, it has the advantage that also the poor municipalities can then afford it. And Cardoso uh, was attracted by the idea and he implemented uh, that co-funding by the federal level uh, for two main reasons. One uh, is that it was a way of stabilizing the population because what you had in Brazil was this, uh, this uh, rural exodus, people coming from the poor uh, parts of Brazil and flocking into the favelas and the, the slums in the bigger cities, in Sao Paulo, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, one. And the second thing is that uh, Cardoso uh, saw that, rightly in my view, as an investment in the human capital of the country. Because this was, uh, in part, of course, a way of reducing child poverty and enabling children to grow up uh, in, a, in a sufficiently healthy way. But it was also coupled in the Brazilian case and in many of uh, the other uh, schemes that have then uh, developed, uh, uh, spread in other countries. There are about 60 countries which have now schemes of that sort. There was also a condition of school attendance. Uh, you got, families got it, providing the children were going to school a sufficient uh, percentage of the time. And there were also compulsory health checks. Uh, so the, the parents had to take their children to get their health checked. Turned out from the research, uh, evidence-based uh, information showed that these conditions didn't have that much of an impact because the main impact uh, in terms of school attendance was simply the fact that there was some income, a higher income that was given to these families so that the kids didn't need to spend their time begging or, or, or working. But these two things really convinced Cardoso to, to generalize uh, this uh, system, still at the municipal level, but um, uh, co-funded by uh, the the federal state, uh, it, uh, the two reasons being stabilization of the population, of the rural population to some extent, one, and, and secondly, this aspect of uh, investment in, in the human capital. When Lula took over uh, in 2004, already said he signed this law which gave a long-term perspective, he didn't really believe in it, he, uh, in the idea of a universal uh, unconditional basic income, but it did uh, implement what is now called the Bolsa Familia, which is a, a very uh, general, not very generous, but, uh, but uh, a very uh, general uh, as social public assistance scheme for poor families. Uh, so there are, I think, um, about 13 million families. Uh, so that means probably about 50 million people who uh, benefit uh, from uh, this uh, Bolsa Familia. It still was very popular. Now, the uh, situ political situation in Brazil is uh, pretty chaotic. Uh, the Brazilian senator I mentioned lost his seat uh, four years ago, but uh, there is election next, uh, next month and he's uh, most uh, likely to, to get his uh, seat back. So the, and the, that's still uh, in discussion. Bolsa Familia is probably irreversible. But here comes then the question which I uh, want to ask you, uh, which is, you can say, well, you have there in Brazil a system now, in place now for uh, nearly 15 years, 
uh, a system that is uh, a form of guaranteed minimum income uh, means tested, so only for the poor people below a certain level. But how do they do, uh, how, how do they uh, implement the scheme so that they can find all the poor and only the poor? Hmm? That's what a means test or an income test means. How do they proceed? So once I went uh, with the senator, I went to the, to the desk where um, people had to come and um, uh, request um, inclusion, uh, registration in the scheme. There was a man in front of me with broken glasses, and he was asked, um, how much did you earn last year? Well, he had worked a bit at the petrol station uh, a few weeks, uh, didn't remember exactly how many. His wife was uh, selling some fruit on the market, so he had to give a figure about how much he earned. Okay in the previous year, so that to see whether he was poor and therefore entitled to the scheme. You realize that it's very difficult to remember in an informal context how much you earned the previous year, uh, between the 1st of January and the 31st of December of the previous year. Um, even more difficult to predict what you are going to earn uh, this year. And it's certainly not in your interest to try to remember too much, right? Because the more you remember, uh, the less of a benefit you receive. So, nevertheless, this is the way uh, Brazil functions at the moment. Uh, uh, in order to simplify somewhat the procedures, once you are in the register, you can keep uh, the benefit for six years unless the composition of your household changes, but there is not another means test, so people uh, assess more or less vaguely. Of course, the degree of control you can have in a bigger city is less than in a small village. You realize immediately the um, imperfection of this system. Uh, first of all, it's not that easy to uh, make sure that the benefit goes only to the poor, because uh, you, it's based largely on self-reporting of how much you earn. Secondly, it's not easy either to find all the poor, because you people need to be informed about their rights. It's very stigmatizing to go to the desk and say, sorry, I'm destitute, I can't really make ends meet, uh, give me some benefit. So there is a, a problem, so-called problem of uh, the rate of take-up. And you can also imagine the room there is for clientelism. And so people, the, the local office, uh, I mean, it's a friend or a cousin, and so, okay, we'll see, we'll, we'll give you, we're entitled to you, and you'll receive for six years, you receive this, this benefit. Big problem. Is there an alternative? That's what I call the Brazilian, Brazilian solution. Second solution, the Mexican solution. In Mexico, they have had different names, uh, Progresa or Pro Oportunidades, um, the, but, but they have a scheme which is also means tested for the poor, quite uh, extensive now. And uh, uh, how do they proceed there? There is no self-declaration of income. What they did is that they have a, a massive uh, household survey which, uh, uh, in which the income of the households is assessed, but also a number a large number of other variables, like uh, do you own a car, how old is the car, do you own a, own a motorcycle, do you own a bike, how many rooms do you have in a house, do you have an inside toilet or an outside toilet, how many windows, how many light bulbs, etc., etc. They put all this in a computer and then they, uh, they find a sort of a multivariate uh, nice uh, regression and they find the best linear combination of these uh, 60 variables, I think that is the best predictor of a household's uh, income. This leads to uh, a score on an index and uh, with a cutoff point and all the households below that level uh, are entitled uh, to uh, transfer those above the level uh, are not. Um, well, can this work better? Obviously, there is a degree of arbitrariness because there will be a number of people uh, of households with a higher income that uh, happen to score worse in terms of these variables and they receive the benefit and others with exactly the same income that don't receive. 
one problem. Two, there can't be any way for uh, people to check whether they were rightly treated because the formula is kept a secret. It's kept a secret because you don't want people to, uh, to hide the light bulbs or to, uh, to hide the, the bike or the, et cetera uh, when the test is being made. Once, then, once you know what sort of indicators are going to be used. And you, so that means that the, the formula is hidden and therefore you are subjected, of course, to there's no way in which you can challenge you being you not being on it because I say, well, it's the formula that decided. Science has decided that you are not poor because the best predictor with these 60 variables has given you a score that is uh, higher. Um, again, the room for clientelism is enormous huh? because it's the locals, who, the local uh, officials who can say, well, you. Yes, uh, we checked and you are above uh, this or in going to check in the houses. Uh, is this really a bicycle when there is only one wheel or is this a really light bulb where uh, it, um, it is never used, etc., etc. And so you can see the difficulty. That's the, the second strategy which a number of countries uh, are actually uh, using at the moment. Right? I repeat, these are two ways of trying to have a system that helps the poor all the poor, only the poor, in the context in which you have a large informal economy. And then uh, it's in this context, so you think about the first one, you say that's not very satisfactory. At some point, you may have a backlash. I remember on one of my visits in, the, in Brazil, there was a big scandal because uh, there was a small municipality in the Amazon forest where all the uh, employees of the municipality had received uh, their Bolsa Familia. And so, uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, clientelism can work uh, very easily. And so there's always the fear that there will be a backlash. And um, it's very likely that there are, in uh, Brazil now, hundreds of thousands of households that receive the Bolsa Familia without being strictly entitled to it. Uh, but very difficult to check. And, and this may lead, uh, and depending on who is the next president, uh, to, to a, big, uh, a big backlash and, and then uh, a regression and the, 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 the sort of dismantling of this program. Uh, in uh, Mexico, uh, similarly, you have this incredible amount of then uh, uh, official uh, discretion or uh, in, in uh, lack of transparency because of the use of, uh, of this formula. And it's in this context that a number of people have been saying, from uh, the World Bank uh, to local activists, the only real solution is an unconditional basic income. And um, in, indeed, and this, uh, um, and my question to you will be, what do you think would be most appropriate in, in um, Egypt? And I'll um, finish then by uh, mentioning something that uh, happened in Iran not uh, uh, so long ago, about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and that may have some analogy with uh, the, the Egyptian situation, closer than the analogy I just suggested uh, with Brazil. Uh, um, so about 10 years ago, it uh, was then the, this president who I, whose picture I have in mind, but who has uh, an unpronounceable name with about five syllables. I can't, can't remember uh, the name. So uh, his government realized that there was something uh, very bad in the socio-economic organization of uh, uh, Iran at the time, which was that there was a large implicit subsidy to energy and to fossil fuels. Iran uses uh, fossil fuels, but the cost of um, oil in the Iranian context, uh, context was much lower than the international price of oil. Mm. This is uh, bad, huh? so this uh, implicit subsidy for two reasons, which are obvious. First, reasons of fairness, uh, because uh, uh, obviously the main beneficiaries of uh, uh, subsidies to energy, this holds of course for uh, Egypt just as much as for Iran or anywhere else in the world, uh, uh, you I mean, the biggest beneficiaries are of course the people who consume most oil directly or indirectly. Uh, uh, whether in your car or through all the products that need uh, 
or at some point uh, in uh, in their production or in the production of their components. Okay, uh, one on grounds of fairness is not a very clever measure, and it's of course not a very clever measure in uh, terms of economic efficiency either, because it leads uh, to uh, all sorts of bad decisions like uh, underinvestment in public transport, underinvestment um, in um, uh, in alternative forms of energy, overinvestment uh, in uh, roads, uh, suburban sprawls, etc., uh, etc. Et and so they decided to uh, gradually uh, align the price of oil in the Iranian uh, in Iran, uh, align it on the international price. But if you do that, of course, there is a massive negative impact on the standard of living of the poor in that country. And then they said, okay, we'll compensate that by introducing a form of uh, subsidy to the poor in cash. And then they faced the problem of the large informal economy and decided, after all, it's so complicated to identify the poor in Iran to, that they'll introduce simply a non-conditional uh, basic income, universal to all. But then, uh, uh, and then they said, but the minister of the energy said, but I'm rich enough, I'm not going to claim it, right? But in principle, everyone is entitled to it. And then you had all the sanctions against Iran, and they had underestimated, overestimated the revenues from uh, increased oil, they are oil producers, and they would have received all, all this income, but it was a higher tax elasticity of uh, the consumption of oil, uh, higher than they expected. Anyway, it uh, led to some sort of chaotic uh, uh, situation, and it wasn't implemented as smoothly and as uh, sort of uh, rigorously as uh, was intended. But of course, this is also relevant to the uh, Egyptian situation today, as I understand it, because I think it does make sense, as uh, in this country as elsewhere, unless there is an aspect which I don't perceive, it does make sense to uh, increase the price of oil, uh, and it does create a lot of hardship for uh, poor people in the country. That requires compensation, and then you have to think about how best to do that. And uh, so, what from what the sort of uh, information uh, kindly given to me by uh, Sarah, who is uh, somewhere in the room there, and so I understand that uh, you have these two. Um, forms of uh, cash uh, transfers. Uh, one is called uh, Takaful, if I remember correctly, and um, the other one is called uh, Karama. Uh, so Karama is more like uh, the uh, non-contributory pension system, very extensive, which exists in South Africa, and, um, and which works quite well. That would be easier to implement than a general uh, means tested minimum income for families. But uh, Takaful is more like the Bolsa Familia in Brazil and the, uh, and the, the Mexican uh, scheme. So, but so far, it's a rather marginal scheme, not very expensive in, uh, as a share of GDP. But the more the volume of this sort of scheme increases in order to compensate the rise in uh, energy prices, the more you'll be faced with the same sort of problems as uh, Mexico and uh, Brazil. So. Is a basic income solution uh, uh, really better than the other two that requires that you have a sufficiently reliable tax base, uh, no doubt, and uh, part of it, of course, would be the increase in the, in the revenues from, from, on the consum consumption of energy. Does that give enough uh, leeway? Are other forms of uh, taxation realistic? In South Africa, they said we should go for VAT, for value-added tax, for more consumption tax that gives a more reliable tax base than a personal income tax, et cetera, et cetera. So I finish here. So and to sum up in just a, a few words, uh, I do believe that basic income is relevant for a country like Egypt, partly as a sort of vision for the long term, for a just society, for a society that would not just be a capitalist society with a little bit of charity for the people left on the side. No, a uh, society in which the, the, the dynamics of the market would be used in not in order to enslave people, but in order to liberate them, thanks to this unconditional basic income that gives more bargaining power to the people with least bargaining power. 
in our society. So it's a vision for the long term, but it's also in the shorter term uh, a solution to the problem of trying to secure a minimum level of subsistence to the poor in a country in which a large part of the economy is informal. To solve that problem, you may have the Brazilian solution, self-declaration, the Mexican solution, this proxy uh, based on uh, various uh, indicator, but the third uh, uh, solution that was um, believed to be realistic by my uh, South African colleague who I mentioned at the start would be really a universal basic income. That's, so my question to you is, is any of these three solutions uh, realistic for uh, Egypt? Uh, if so, which one is the best one? very uh, extensive expose uh, of the different ways uh, social policy can uh, be implemented in a country. So uh, uh, actually, I, the audience was hoping to ask you a question, but you turn the table and uh, you, you're going to ask them a question. Uh, but uh, um, but uh, the important thing is that, that there is a clear difference. If I were to summarize your, uh, your talk in just a couple of sentences, the main difference between uh, uh, unconditional uh, basic income, unconditional basic income, is the notion of means testing, that people are being given the transfer based on their economic conditions. Uh, and this always suffer from the inclusion and inclusion error. Inclusion that you include people that should not receive, or exclusion, uh, exclusion, exclusion error that people who are not, who are supposed to be receiving the income are not receiving. It. So what uh, this idea of universal basic income kind of uh, bypasses this idea. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, in Egypt since uh, November 2016, uh, the government is adopting this program uh, of uh, um, reducing the, the, the bill of energy subsidy and increasing and expanding the, the two key uh, social uh, protection programs that has Takaful and Karama. Uh, now, obviously, the, the, if you ask anyone in this room about uh, increasing energy prices, uh, I don't think you'll get favorable uh, opinions about it. Um, uh, so, uh, Maybe we want to get questions because I think people want to learn more about universal basic income and then we can maybe open the floor for people to give what they think uh, what our best approach for Egypt. Thank you. So what we'll do is we'll take uh, multiple rounds of three questions uh, and then uh, at each round, uh, Philippe will be able to answer. Hello, uh, my name is Ahmad Yusri. Uh, I would like to ask you. Okay, uh, I work in an NGO called the Modern Foundation for Development and uh, Education Improvement, and uh, I'm a big uh, enthusiastic about UBI. I've been reading like for like two years now. I read your book earlier, and that's why I came here. It's uh, an honor to have you here. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, challenges that uh, liberal people uh, like challenge UBI is that it's a, a tool for Big Brother to control the masses. So basically having the UBI uh, to give people subsidies, this give the authority uh, the tool. And one of the main uh, solutions that is rising now is the using uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, uh, how do you call it? blockchains uh, to uh, distribute it and make it universal and even without n a need for an authority in the first place. So uh, there are projects now running and testing and multiple ICOs happened last year about this. My question is what is your take about using cryptocurrency or the blockchain as a tool to implement UPI. Thank you. Um, my name is Pascal Anik. I work for the International Labour Organization. Um, I used to work with one of your uh, great colleagues, Guy Standing. 
Um, so concerning your question, uh, the two programs, uh, Taka Full Karama, they are no going further than the Mexican model, uh, limited means tested benefit. Okay. Um, with proxy, both. Okay. And um, um, so we are, I think we are a little bit far from uh, a universal basic uh, income uh, step. Um, the question I have is, um, first of all, at the time when it was in 2014, there was uh, on the table options for moving towards universal cash transfer, but um, it was, yeah, of course, in Egypt, but it was, easy, it was removed uh, for several reasons. Some international pressure, uh, international financial organization um, would consider it that would be too expensive, of course. And, uh, and also you are in a country where um, on the one hand, you have this old tradition of assistance to the poor, zakat fund, you know, so uh, the poorest would benefit of transfer from the richest, but it would be limited to the one who, need, who are in needs, okay? Um, in, informally, yeah, it can be, it, it's formal or informal. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you have this this uh, strong tradition, and uh, and also you have this uh, common feeling that if you provide universal basic income, uh, people will not work, okay? Because they would just rely on this uh, transfer. What are um, uh, from your experience? What are the arguments? And what are the? Can you can you explain what are? Uh, the counter example of that, as I'm also a great supporter of basic income. Thank you. Last question. I'm Dr. Khaled, Mr. Tamuil, Mr. Smar. Tamuil and Mr. Smar. Damit. Technology of the world. Ah, and الفقر أن موارد المجتمع المداخلة بتاع حكي يرتبا I'm gonna ask everyone please to keep that interaction أي ماشي أوكي أوكي بس أنا عشان بس نوضع إن الفقر هو أن موارد المجتمع لو وزع التوزيع عادي لا تكفي أما صناعة الفقر فإن موارد المجتمع تكفي ولكن بيتم توجيه توجيه خاطئ بدف الفقر المجتمع أنا الحل بالنسبة لي كان في رسالة الدكتوراه بتاعتي هي نظرية استثمار الطاقة الفقدة أو العطلة دي ممكن أن تكون غطاء اجتماعي وبوستوك جديد جدا جدا دون ان تداخل الدوله ودون ان تحمل اعباء اضافيه لا على المجتمع ولا على الافراد وده اعتقد ان هو افضل ودي موجوده ريسيرش موجود ولكن للاسف هم مش عايزين يطبقوه ومش هيحمل الدوله اي تكلفه يعني انا ممكن مش نحل المشكله البطاله نشتري مشكله البطاله لكن احنا ممنوعين مش مش قادرين اذا المشكله مش في الحل مشكله في اراده الحل سو وي جونا تيك ثري كويشنز ات ا تايم سو وي دو انذر راوند ثانك يو I'm not sure I've uh, fully understood the, the last uh, question. Um, yes, on uh, the question of uh, cryptocurrency or alternative currency, I've, uh, my short take on that is that I've always been skeptical about that. That is, uh, I really think that uh, we need uh, to, to have a significant basic income we need the legal tender and so the, the official um, uh, currency in the country. Also because uh, all these uh, alternative currencies are based on uh, voluntary communities. So it's sort of voluntary associations, but in the case a basic income is really an income that must be given to all the members of the community and you can't rely on the self uh, selections of, uh, of the people. So some, um, so the variants of the cryptocurrency proposals may be able to go around this difficulty, but I really uh, can't see how. So um, uh, we have a brief note about that in, in, our, in, in our book, but uh, I stick to my skepticism about that. Then, uh, well, um, um, yes, uh, so um, there's this whole tradition of charity and uh, that shouldn't be substituted by... Uh, 
by uh, sort of uh, uh, state organized schemes because huh? this was uh, also the case uh, throughout the history of these schemes in Europe, in particular in the 16th century when the first schemes were introduced, there was a very strong uh, opposition from the church or from uh, religious uh, institutions and there are still there is still a little bit of that that is present uh, today in the Christian world where some people say you know there is a big difference between the warm solidarity that is shown by people who are generous and then received by peop by the people uh, by uh, the, the recipients with gratitude and I say that's the virtue uh, of virtue of generosity virtue of gratitude when you have that organized by the states, it's uh, an obligation uh, to pay taxes uh, with great resentment usually, and then people claiming uh, their rights. And this is called solidarity, and that uh, has something ugly about it. And so you have that, and so there is that component in some of the opposition, it's marginal in Europe today, but uh, or in the US, it may be more significant in the US, uh, this sort of opposition to uh, state organized schemes. This would hold for means tested schemes just as much as uh, for uh, universal schemes. For the, the second, um, you, your second remark, which is on the willingness to work, of course, the universality as opposed to the means test is rather good for the incentive to work. Right? Because in the case of the means test, means test amounts to saying you receive this only if you are poor. And then we can see that you earn a little income by selling things on the market, by uh, becoming a little entrepreneur. Uh, and then we say, fantastic, now we are going to punish you by withdrawing the benefit. That's what a means test means. Um, of course, uh, if you have a universal benefit, you have this floor on which you can stand. It's not a safety net, it's a floor on which you can stand. And you work, you take a little job, you accept an internship, you are being trained somewhere for little pay, all this can be added to your basic income. And so the universal aspect of an unconditional basic income, the fact that there is no means test, is good for work incentives for the people at the bottom. What is controversial, and that's what I alluded to when I said you needed a doctrine in order to face the moral argument, what is controversial is the fact that it's duty duty free in this sense, obligation free. You are not, uh, and so basic income, contrary to the schemes that exist in Europe, don't require you to be available on the labor market if you are able to work. It says it's unconditional. And it's essentially if you want to give power to the people with least power, right? because most of the people in the room have uh, skills, valuable skills that can have a, an income that's far above uh, the, the, the average income of the Egyptian because of the specific skills they have. And the bargaining power they have is due to that and to some extent to the collective organizations when there are trade unions. But there are people without any bargaining power and what the basic income does because of its unconditionality, not because of its universality, because of its being obligation free, is give more bargaining power with the people with least of it. The possibility to say no to some lousy, dirty jobs where you are not respected in your... So do that. However, you fund the basic income, it will always mean a redistribution of purchasing power and of bargaining power from men to women. However you fund it, whatever the level, uh, whatever you replace, uh, think about that, it will always be a redistribution from men to women. And of course, women in our societies, wherever I have in general low uh, lower level of uh, bargaining power and of power uh, to cool. I'm not sure I understood the, the uh, final question because um, uh, there is an important point that you have to distinguish the poverty of individuals and the poverty of a society. The poverty of a society, you cannot uh, say, well, we'll solve it through redistribution uh, if, uh, unless it's redistribution uh, from, uh, from abroad. Uh, you need to organize uh, the production of uh, resources in such a way to make the society less poor in terms of its GDP per capita. But of course, some people say that uh, basic income is also meant and that's, uh, um, uh, to be a contribution to the productivity of a society, in part for the reason 
Cardoso, uh, I mentioned in connection with uh, President Cardoso, um, basic income, having less children growing up in poverty, enabling them to go to school, uh, uh, is uh, something that is an investment in the human capital and therefore in the wealth of, of a country. Uh, but uh, and it's true, I didn't emphasize it, uh, but essentially I have presented basic income as, a, in a way, a more efficient way of facing the problem of the poverty of households and individuals, given uh, the, uh, the level uh, of economic development of a particular country. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you again, we're, go we're going to do another round of questions. I'm going to ask you please to identify yourself and kindly please turn off your phones. Yes. Uh, uh, Sarah? Okay, my name is Salma. I'm a researcher. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, do, do you intend to replace the minimum wage by the UBI, or is it to complement it? Do you, re, do you intend to replace the minimum wage by UBI, or are they complementary? Uh, second question, how do you evaluate the UBI uh, advocated by the IMF? Does it have the advocated by the IMF? The, the UBI advocated lately, but recently by the IMF. Are you familiar with the suggestion? Yes. <laughs> so, um, and the third question, I thought I, I'd hear it already by now. How to finance a UBI in, in our developing uh, country with very low rate of uh, tax to GDP? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Ragno, Chief Social Policy, UNICEF. So thanks for, for the talk. Uh, I had a, uh, two quick questions. One, uh, Brazil. I mean, you mentioned Brazil. It's a bit unique, Brazil. And uh, uh, in, uh, actually, in 2013, I had the opportunity to meet these senators. And one of the key points um, is that they were making is uh, uh, that in Brazil, they view poverty as a consequence of a failure of the state to enable citizens not to be poor. And this is a, an important distinction from many other countries, how they view poverty. And therefore, you know, they started the Bolsa Familia and they are also there is a, a law, as you mentioned, uh, about the uh, basic income. So how do you see this happening in other countries that don't have that view of poverty or the, co the causes of poverty? Because the way you view poverty defines the strategies that you adopt to reduce poverty. And then you mentioned, if I may, another one. Uh, you mentioned Italy. I'm Italian, and unfortunately, that uh, is still not in place. I mean, there is discussion, hopefully, it's going to happen. But the, the, the key point is that the basic income in Italy will be a sort of a top up to make sure that poor households can reach a minimum income, right? It's not going to be a um, like a, a transfer, a, just a transfer, the same transfer for everyone, it will be a top up. Now, in informal economy, you won't be able to know how much a family is, uh, is earning. So can this uh, universal income or universal you know, transfer, uh, the same transfer for every family, become an instrument that fosters inequality? Meaning a family which is less poor uh, will get the same amount as the family that is not that poor. There's not as poor, I mean, it's uh, poorer than this family. So that can let's say, uh, maintain these inequalities and so on. So what's your take on that? Thank you. And the last question, Sara, the gentleman over here in the back. I'm going to take another round, don't uh, Sara? Gentleman here. In the back, the man. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I'm a geophysicist. Uh, can you speak up, please, May? My name is Ahmed. I'm a geophysicist. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid uh, that the UBI solution is uh, irrelevant to the Egyptian context. Uh, I have uh, one evaluative ob objection to that uh, solution. Uh, I think it's totally irrelevant uh, in, in Egypt uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to make uh, or to redistribute uh, or to use the cash the cash subsidy subsidies uh, I think it, it didn't help uh, poor poor in Egypt 
it didn't accelerate the social mobility. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it, it will not. Uh, re it will not adjust the, the distribution of wealth uh, in, in in Egypt. Uh, actually, the, the governments or the political regime use uh, cash subsidies as um, a tool to contain the public discontent. Um, I'm a far bit. I'm a far skeptical uh, in regard to UPI. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I have a, a logistical and uh, administrative objection to, to, to that UBI. Um, I think we didn't have we didn't have any uh, efficient or uh, sophisticated uh, sophisticated taxation system or statistical uh, f uh, in infrastructure to support uh, or to, uh, to, to, to use uh, uh, the, the obtained data uh, in, making, uh, in making social policy. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll do another round. So uh, three very important uh, yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm going to use my authority and I'm going to elaborate on Ahmed's question, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Now or after? Okay. Uh, well, should, should I reply yeah. to this and, yes, then, right. and then you? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, uh, three questions there. Uh, does it replace the minimum wage? No. And uh, that is, of course, the minimum wage uh, may... And it's a complex question, in fact, because... Uh, and related to uh, some of the other questions because it depends on the way in which it is funded. In uh, developed countries, in fact, the basic income will be funded uh, to a large extent by the personal income tax, and that means that uh, the wages will, in fact, be taxed more in such a way that uh, for you to keep uh, paying the workers the same net wage, given that their wage will be taxed more, they'll receive a basic income, but you won't be able to uh, reduce even the, the minimum wage. But the minimum wage serves a, numbers of, a number of functions, including uh, fighting uh, black labor, because there is a minimum amount everyone needs to be paid uh, per hour. And so I'm, and the, the defending the basic income doesn't amount to getting rid of the minimum wage, and it can have its impact on the level of an employment with an unchanged uh, minimum wage. We try to explain that more than I can now uh, in the book. Uh, the IMF version of the basic income, I know the base, uh, IMF was very interested in basic income. They try uh, to push us after the publication of the book to write a substantive article for uh, their uh, review. But they wanted to do so much editing in the article that in the end I said, we are not, I'm not playing that game. It's my article, not yours. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, it's, a, it's, not, it's not published. I don't know whether it was a particular editor of that news that that was a bit too stubborn, or the IMF itself. But I'm sure that the IMF, it cannot be uh, official IMF policy to introduce an unconditional basic income. Uh, the way of funding it, and that is related to uh, the, the last uh, question. Um, um, of course, uh, uh, basic, if you give uh, a basic income to everyone, you must be able, it's also related to one of your questions, you must be able to claw back the uh, basic income that you give uh, to the richer people, the people who are above the, and not only the very rich, but the, even the people who are somewhat above uh, the, the, say, the minimum wage, and that they'll need to pay for their own basic income. And that means that in one way or another, you must have a tax system that works sufficiently well, and that may indeed uh, not exist in a number of countries, not only in Egypt, also in Brazil. It doesn't really uh, exist at uh, that level. Now, uh, in some countries, like uh, the, much of the debate in India in the moment says, well, you can fund a, a very modest ba basic income that is administratively workable because of uh, more and more people have a personal bank account so that you can uh, send automatically uh, without much uh, trouble, uh, and because you don't have a means test to, to check you, you send a basic income to everyone. And much of that, providing the level remains modest, or all of that, 
can be funded by the reduction of the existing subsidies. In India, the main debate is about the food subsidies and the right to food, which in many cases is then uh, takes the form of um, uh, free food distributed to people with a lot, lot of clientelism, lots of corruption uh, in the providers, and a lot of inefficiency. One of my Indian colleagues said uh, essentially the food program in India is a, a, a minimum income for rats uh, because uh, all the food remains uh, in heaps and then uh, is eaten by rats before it uh, reaches the people. And so some of, of the Indian economists, and it went to even the chief economist of the current government, um, sort of uh, advocated the moves in that direction. Um, they say, well, in, in a country like India, it is fundable, but only through the reduction or the elimination of many of the existing subsidies. In, um, in other countries, for example, people think that was the case in South Africa. It was very present in the Swiss referendum, also uh, recently on, on the question. And it was in place briefly uh, in Brazil, some people also think of using um, a very simple way of, uh, uh, of taxation, which is instead of taxing income or consumption, uh, taxing any electronic transfer, any electronic transfer, even from your, your savings account to your current account. Uh, the total, of course, as payments become incre increasingly electronic, in some countries they are like Sweden, they are thinking of suppressing uh, cash altogether. Uh, it's a very simple, very, you can easily trace all these uh, uh, payments. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it's progressive in, uh, uh, even in, in a rough way, not as strictly as an income tax, but it's, uh, it's progressive. It discourages uh, speculation. And uh, this uh, so-called, um, it's, it's sort of super Tobin tax in, in some sense on, 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 all, uh, on, on every single payment. And some people say, well, this is the future of, uh, and then you, you have a tax base. And the, and, but of course, the technological conditions for this to be in place in, uh, in uh, these conditions are present in Sweden, but they are not present in Egypt and are not present in, in Brazil. But, um, but this is a way of thinking about it. Uh, in for for a, a more remote future, um, yes, the, there may be something uh, different, say, in Brazil in terms of general uh, the state of public opinion and the attitude about what uh, um, about what uh, the poor are entitled to and why. I was struck in Brazil by uh, uh, the fact that the, the public concern was, there was a concern formulated in terms of busca, and busca is the, the search for, uh, in connection with Borsa Familia. What are you searching? In fact, uh, uh, the, the search was for the false negatives, that is for the people who were still not among these 13 million uh, households and were entitled to it. In fact, in, in, in the Belgian context or the European context, the busca and the search would be more for the false uh, positives, all the people who may be cheating the system in one way or another, um, but mainly then because of the availability for, for work uh, uh, conditions. So there may be cultural differences between countries and that uh, Catholic countries may be uh, different from Protestant countries in, in some respects, but I can't believe that Brazil can be a sort of absolutely unique case, unique case in this respect. And I'm sure the Brazilian, Brazilian society is also not homogeneous. There must be very different feelings, uh, of course, in part related to people's personal interest. Italy. Um, Italy, under the Gentiloni government, introduced a very modest uh, form of uh, means-tested uh, guaranteed income and the uh, reddito di inclusione. Uh, which uh, Italy is the last uh, uh, country, even after Greece, in the European Union to have introduced such a system at the national level. The so-called citizenship income, uh, reddito di cittadinanza, of, uh, proposed by Cinque Stelle, the, 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 became the, the bigger, uh, the, the party with the biggest, uh, the largest number of votes at the last uh, general election, they had on their program something called citizens, citizenship income, which is one of the names used to refer to basic income. 
but it is also means tested uh, basic income simply at a level that's about uh, three and a half times uh, the level of the ready to the inclusion but what's that was included in the in the government's program i'm extremely i don't believe that it is going to be introduced in that sort of level but it's definitely not a basic income even though there was a lot of uh, confusion that was introduced in in the the italian debate by the choice of the name i think i've answered to your last question and about and so it's not in terms of the impact on uh, equality and inequality and so the of course the rich will receive a basic income but giving a basic income to the rich is not better to the rich it's better for the poor uh, it's important to understand that and the, there are several reasons why this is the case but here the most immediate uh, reason is simply that the rich because of taxation or reduce, uh, reduction in subsidies uh, from which they benefit more than others the rich are going to pay not only for their own basic income but also for some of the basic income of the poor so there will be a redistribution top to bottom among households and moreover and that's often neglected there will be a redistribution within households uh, uh, on average from men to women uh, so because of the strictly individual nature of uh, of the basic income and then uh, i think i've i've answered the the question at the back which is that uh, i understood you said it's uh, repeatedly that you don't think that in unconditional basic income is a good idea for egypt i say yes i agree with you now because in order to make it uh, uh, an idea that uh, that can work of course you you cannot just say oh we are going to give this to everyone without having a way of funding it that is uh, credible and wouldn't have uh, disastrous consequences for uh, the economy i think these conditions are satisfied by a number of countries but you need a greater formalization of the economy or a different way of uh, uh, raising uh, resources in order to make it stick i just want to uh, elaborate on the, the the three questions uh, the, 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 the in the egyptian context uh, for many decades uh, for as long as the Republic has been uh, established in Egypt, the, the main part of the social contract was to subsidize energy and food. So the, moving away from subsidy into conditional cash transfer, uh, like the Mexican and the Brazilian case, has been very, very costly on the overall society. So, so costly in, what sense? In, in terms of reduced purchasing power, in terms of inflation, and 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 uh, obviously we don't have any r credible public opinions, but I will make the claim that the, 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 the cost of inflation has been tremendously high, that if you were to rank the options of social policies for Egyptians, they would probably say we want a direct price subsidy uh, as a form of social protection. Yeah. And, and, and this is particularly because this is for historical reasons, for cultural reasons, uh, that they perceive the direct subsidy through pricing, especially for poor, is the best way to go forward. And again, I'm gonna echo what the, the comment here that it, the, from the state perspective, poor are poor because they don't work. So initiating a, a universal basic income would foster the idea that, well, if you give them cash, they will not work more. But of course, I'm telling you an idea, even though no, I'm... No, no, but it's very interesting. And of course, economists can see through this fiction. They can realize that these subsidies are, in fact, uh, benefiting uh, yeah. far more than proportionally the rich rather than the poor. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and, and moreover, that these subsidies lead to all sorts of economically irrational decisions. Mm -hmm. So that I believe it's a difficult decision to take huh? because it, not only because you have this this fiction even if it's fully compensated for the poor of course it's perceived as inflation in uh, huh? because these price these prices and and then all the goods the price of all the goods that uh, require some some energy that goes up but in this if you redirect uh, these resources to supporting the income of the poor of course it uh, it can be more than compensated uh, for the poor. So it's difficult, a difficult decision because of all this illusion, unavoidable illusion in public opinion, including among the poor who, who would benefit from it, but also because of the massive lobbies that will then entertain and play on this 
illusion. So that sometimes you need a, a non-democratic government in order to take decisions that uh, can be in the benefit. That's why we we'll have something called the European Commission in Europe. That we'll take another round of questions. أنا اسمي أحمد عنتر شغال في وزارة التموين وباحث دكتوراه في الاقتصاد السياسي. أنا بس عايز أسأل كيف يتم تطبيق الدخل الأساسي الشامل في مصر ما عدا وجود معايير وقواعد حاكمة توضح وتبين الفرق بين الدخل الفعلي والدخل الرسمي. فبعض الأسر أو بعض الأشخاص في نظر الدولة والحكومة إن هم فقراء لأنه موظف وظيفة لا تتعدى راتبها 3000 جنيه. ولكن في المقابل من ذلك هو من اصحاب الثروات واصحاب العقارات اللي بتبر دخل يتعدى يحسب من اغناء الدوله ومع ذلك بيستحق دعم لانه هو في النظر الدخل الفعلي فقير. تاني حاجه هو ما هو تاثير الدخل الاساسي الشامل في الاقتصاد المصري في ظل النمو الضعيف وعدم وجود صناعات قويه سؤثر في المجتمع لان انا هدي فلوس للمواطن انا ما عنديش صناعات قويه داخل المجتمع وانا ما عنديش نمو قوي في المجتمع فازاي الفلوس دي هي يعني هو اهل هيعود على الصناعات المصريه او على الاقتصاد بشكل عام في ظل تطبيق هذه المنظومه شكرا انا هو شغال انا اسمي بيسان تعرفي نفسك اه اه انا اسمي بيسان انا كنت عايزه اسال اعرفي نفسك انا اسمي بيسان انا صحفيه كنت عايزه اسال عن يعني اذا اذا احنا شايفين ان مصر ما فيهاش نظام ضريبي كفء كما قيل او عادل ان اذر ووردز يعني يعني الى اي مدى ممكن يكون المساله مطروحه اصلا انا مش قادره افهم حتى الان اي ريسورسز غير نظام تصاعدي للضريبه عادل فاذا النظام ده مش موجود ومش مطروح لان احنا شفنا يعني ضغوط شديده من القطاع الخاص بعد الثوره وقبلها في مواجهه تصاعديه النظام الضريبي مواجهه الاقتراحات بتصاعديه شكرا. النظام الضريبي في شكرا. اي ريسورس ثانيه ولا يعني سؤال حيك واضح دكتور بشاي عندنا عادل بشاي بروفيسور اوف ايكونومكس ات ذا امريكان يونيفرستي ان كايرو اي شال بي بريف Number one, I am known in Egypt for the man who has always been talking for decades about the informal economy. And I have always said the informal economy is a huge informal. Uh, can you hear me? I am talking in English. Yeah. <laughs> I am saying I have always been talking about the informal economy for decades. And when De Soto visited Egypt twice and visited our president, I am the one who in the public meeting demolished all his arguments because the informal economy, which is probably more than 70% of the GDP of Egypt, is what is keeping us alive and keeping me alive in this room. It's huge. So my argument and the informal economy and my argument and i know you are a professor of philosophy and everything and your career in oxford there is to use a good english word an incipient not many people will understand this word there is an incipient form of basic income in the informal economy which no one has studied properly if you see what i mean because what is happening in the informal economy, many people are doing well and you don't have any record for it. For example, just to give one single example, there are, uh, there are 2.2 million tuk-tuks, this, thing, this uh, small the cart small on three bike. wheels. The small but, uh, tricycle bikes, that, yeah. like the Indian ones. Which are imported in Egypt, which are not registered. And they work, say, two and a half shifts a day. These employ five million people. They don't appear in our employment figure. There are hundreds of cases like that. So there is an incipient kind of universal basic income in the informal sector, and the Egyptians are able to live, and they could live with all these rises in prices and so on. Secondly, just an argument about which is very interesting. I really enjoyed every word you said. When you say moving from the male to the female, we have an, I had an examples from an Italian student because I teach in Rome also, who did a research here in Egypt where they give money to women, not men. Because if you give it to the men, this whole all uh, the idea we keep talking about in Egypt, he will consume hashish, if you see what I mean. And we are super consumers of hashish. But when you give it to the woman, there are two gains. The woman will know how to handle her house and to manage her house, even in Upper Egypt where I come. The woman 
the one does it really need to sort of uh, lift the woman. She really knows how to handle. And she will bring her daughters in a way, this is the long run aspect, the long run advantage. Her daughters, in a way, they will be educated. They will know when to marry and how many children will get. So I just wanted to say this. Thank you. The young lady. Uh, and then on the next round, I'll take you. Uh, 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 OK, this is uh, Maha Mustafa. I'm, uh, can you hear me? Uh, it's working. Uh, this is Maha Mustafa. Also, I teach economics at the American University and the Canadian. Um, comment on, uh, on uh, sentence you just said that the poor are poor because they don't want to work. I think the poor are poor because the government made them poor, not because they don't want to work. Now, the basic income approach is, um, is a good intention uh, for social protection, and I can, see, I can see where that came from, but I don't think that this is the solution for Egypt. Uh, according to the ECS figures, we have uh, 30 million uh, poor people, and the Takaful and Karama project is covering 8 million. So no matter what the government can do, it cannot alleviate poverty through this uh, program. Yet, if uh, it's always an applaud to the government because it's, help, it's doing anything for the poor, no matter how trivial it is. But perhaps what's most important is social justice and not social protection. And that's when, and, and, and this is when everyone has an equal opportunity or chance for education and for healthcare and for job creation. Maybe this will be a way to alleviate poverty from radical means. Thank you. So, uh, Philippe, I'm going to ask you please to be very short in your answer because uh, I, I would like to take another round of questions. So. Um, okay, uh, so let me perhaps uh, go backward then. Uh, um, so I think that uh, social justice um, can it can be defined should not be defined in terms of equality of outcomes, but in terms of equality of opportunities. Okay. But uh, uh, that it doesn't follow from that, that it is achievable through just trying to equalize access to education and jobs irrespective of your social origin. Because there are other uh, differences than social origin in the possibilities that people have to access uh, different jobs. And therefore, uh, uh, a radical, and in my view, the only defensible view of social justice of equal, as equality of opportunities must include an unconditional basic income. Not as a way of equalizing outcomes, but as a way of equalizing opportunities in the true sense, not in the superficial and, in fact, very neoliberal sense of the term, which is content with saying uh, equal starting points with given talents, because people have an equal uh, access to jobs for reasons other than their social, uh, their social origin. Um, but I have to keep my answer short. This is a very important question. And, uh, one, and in a way, it's a question to which I devoted that whole book uh, called Real Freedom for All, which is an attempt to, to, to explain why your basic income follows from the sort of conception of justice uh, you uh, hint at. Then, um, yes. Um, I'll have to uh, understand a bit better the, your first example about how this can be interpreted as a modest uh, basic income, an incipient <laughs> basic income in the informal uh, economy. But on, on your second point, uh, I think it's, uh, it, 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 I mean, this, this um, redistribution of purchasing power and therefore of bargaining power from men to women is extremely important. There is, in the case of South Africa, which is uh, an economy not very different from, uh, from uh, the Egyptian one, there is this very interesting uh, case uh, of this uh, minimum, uh, th this guaranteed minimum pension uh, given mainly to women because women receive it from age 60, men only from 65, and women live too longer. So it was called the, the grandma's uh, pension, really. So it meant that uh, I think 70% of the recipients were women. And one of the impacts studied by Angus Deaton, who received the Nobel Prize in Economics recently, uh, one of the impacts was that the health of the little girls was improved considerably because more of the power was in the hands of the grandma because she received the, the pension. So that illustrates two points. And the general wisdom 
of, uh, in the case of child benefits, uh, I know UNICEF is now campaigning for uh, universal child benefits, uh, 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 organizing a conference on that, but child benefits should be given by default to the mother rather than to the man, and, uh, and that would be another way without going for uh, basic income. Perhaps I'll just uh, take one, um, uh, well, then the, 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 and so, of course, if we had a, a progressive, reli reliable personal income tax uh, taxation system, that would sort of solve the problem. That is why a universal basic income is administratively, uh, sort of uh, uh, financially uh, possible in uh, countries like Western Europe, where you have that. Of course, it's not far from perfect, uh, but uh, but you have that, and that means that. If you fund it in this way, of course, you have a, you have a redistribution. Connection with the, the first question, insofar as uh, I, uh, I understood it, uh, of course, we need to think about basic income, about the impact on basic income on the productivity of the economy as a whole. But, and that is also relevant to other questions, we have thinking ahead for the sort of economy we are uh, getting nowadays, uh, what you need is not really try to force every single hand to work on, and if it doesn't work, then it's going to starve. What you need, and Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of uh, Facebook, expressed that well in his brief uh, allusion and advocacy of a universal basic income when he talked at uh, Harvard last year. He said, in fact, a basic income is a way of uh, giving to everyone the possibility to try new ideas because you have this secure floor, the security, the basic security is not something that hampers productivity. It's something that can help promote productivity if you have enough other measures at the same time, including in the education field to make that uh, possible. So the impact on the productivity of the economy is crucial, but it shouldn't be thought about primarily in terms of immediate labor supply. It's a question of motivating people and improving the human capital of your society. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Um, I'm Khaled, so can you please? Khaled. And... Oh. oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a student of social science at, no, you don't need it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm, a student, I'm a student of social science at African Leadership University. So the way I see it, the way I view it, is universal basic income is a way to compensate or sort of to equalize the unfair privilege of legacy, like it's put, like the way I understand it, it's put in place so that people who do not get as much legacy or as much, like who do not enjoy the privilege of legacy from their parents can have a chance to, can you hear me all right? Yeah, uh, yeah, can enjoy the privilege of trying new ideas as you just quoted Mark Zuckerberg. So, I'm, 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 I'm talking about this Can you be to, please uh, uh, brief in your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm going to be brief. Um, I'm talking about this from the perspective of funding universal basic income, because like the world has been evolving in a way that less and like families and tribes have, have been meaning less and less. And now I think people will be pretty open to paying part of the legacy that they get from parents as a contribution to you know, like a fund for universal basic income or so. So I'm curious to know whether any country has done such a thing and whether it's economically viable. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here. Uh, this is Mahmoud Al-Firgani, a researcher at the uh, Institute of Researchers and uh, uh, African Studies at Cairo University. Uh, I want to ask about the importance of I, uh, UPI on the sustainable human development, which related uh, my uh, proposal to complete the requirement of a PhD of economy. And what about the, the role of uh, the nature of political system and the level of democracy as a determined factor to achieve the final aim of uh, this uh, uh, instrument? Thank you. Uh, the Thank lady you. right next to you. So the question is w w about the the, uh, the, the political democracy. system and the UBI. And the nature system. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Gusun. I'm an MA student uh, anthropology in AUC. 
Um, my question related to the infrastructure, the social service infrastructure. Uh, you're giving in the example, uh, the uh, explanation at the beginning about Brazil and how they were doing this related to making uh, investing in capital through education. But for the Egyptian con uh, in context, it's really different as we have a really, really poor education system. And one of them uh, is because the state is uh, changing yes. its... Uh, one minute, I'm sorry, changing its uh, focus and its priority from giving subsidies to social services, not only food and power, but also to education and uh, to health. And this year, uh, I'm just trying to ask briefly. Yes. Uh, no, yes. Um, should we uh, at the state, and this is, I have it from a dissertation that I, I intended from one of my colleague, Bishoy Magzi, he was saying and trying to see, uh, should the government and the state in developing countries put priority to support its poor, our people who are labeling poor, through subsidies of ser services, social services as education and health, or transfer to cash transfer, which is have oh, it, a culture uh, labeling for its Making Very people good question. Needy. Thank you. One last question. The gentleman here in Arabic. So you. يعني بشكر حضراتكم طبعا على المحاضرة محتاج إنك تعلي صوتك لو سمحت جدا دي كان سؤالي بس هو بيطلع عارف حضرتك لو سمحت وعلي صوتك لو سمحت أنا اسمي أسامة وباحث في علم الاجتماع وكنت بسأل بس عن كيف يمكن تحقيق التوازن بين إنتاجية الفرد في العمل ودخله أو بس شكرا one last question and this is the last question the gentleman with the blue shirt my name is Omar I'm an economics student well regarding proposal of using taxes on the electronic transfers instead of on consumption or um, or or income, uh, will this affect uh, oppose the other target of use of uh, reducing the informal sector's proportion uh, of the economy, and also wouldn't it have an, an if, um, a double taxation problem? I didn't overall get the whole problem you are addressing with this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. So. Be the issue was uh, the taxation on electronic transfer and whether or not it would be a, a double taxation. Okay, so before I give you the floor, I'm gonna uh, use my uh, authority to, give, to do some publicity. Uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, log into our website, aps.aucegypt.edu, and to follow us on social media, on Facebook and on uh, YouTube. All our lectures uh, are uh, posted online. Uh, all the material we have, the research, the background paper on UBI, the, uh, the policy brief on UBI uh, are posted on our website. Uh, we also have all the policy papers, the, uh, all the different products that we have produced in the APS. So I, I, uh, I invite you to uh, subscribe to our newsletter and to our Facebook page and to our YouTube page. I'm done with the publicity. I'll leave it. Uh, okay. And actually, uh, from the, uh, Philippe will actually do a commentary on UBI and it's going to be posted on our uh, uh, page on, uh, on the website. APS. The, the yes, yeah, yeah. aps.eucegypt.edu. Okay, quick uh, reply here. So uh, the question of what you call legacy, so the inheritance, right? Uh, so which people get from their parents. I've, uh, uh, it's a, uh, interesting question because my um, for many reasons but uh, one of them is that when i first had the idea of a basic income in 1982 i thought it could be funded entirely by a tax on uh, inheritance but i've gone off uh, that idea because the amount would not be sufficient uh, but also for uh, other reasons first uh, in our countries uh, the average age of a person who inherits is uh, uh, practically pension age. People inherit when they are nearly 60. And uh, they are, uh, so uh, the idea that uh, a tax, a heavy tax of inheritance would uh, sort of equalize opportunities in the sense mentioned uh, earlier is uh, now become illusory because people inherit at a late stage. The opposition, there is very fierce opposition and in fact a reduction in the, there's now a reduction in the tax rate on uh, inheritance in many countries, in European countries. And, and the opposition comes not from the people who would inherit, but from the people who would bequeath. 
people who say, well, I saved on my life. I, uh, I could have consumed it all. And, uh, and now, because I want to give it instead, it would be taxed very heavily. And uh, that's unfair. And so it's a tax on generosity. And, uh, and so I, the, it's, a, it's easier, paradoxically, it's easier to, to tax incomes than to tax inheritance. But it's only an apparent paradox because the bulk of our income, people who've been paid well, like me, for the whole of their career, the bulk of it, of, of my income, has nothing to do with my efforts and my work. I earn so much compared to people doing the same job 100 years ago or in less developed countries, not because of uh, I'm terribly intelligent or because I work terribly hard, but simply because I've been so lucky to grow up under conditions for which I did strictly nothing. So that taxing income is also a way of taxing inheritance, because inheritance incorporated in the productivity of our societies. And so I strongly believe, and it's not unrelated to your question about the opportunities and the true sense of opportunities. Political system, I, I, I'll be, it's a very broad and important uh, question. I think ultimately, we'll have a basic income. We can only have a basic income in a sustainable way if we have a democracy that functions well. That is, and a democracy that functions well is not a democracy that is responsive to the interest in, of every person. It's a democracy in which there is a public discourse of justification of whatever measure is, is uh, uh, taken or proposed, uh, uh, a justification that is acceptable to all uh, and is therefore respects all the conceptions of the good life and takes uh, into account the interest of everyone in a fair way. It's only a, a, a well-functioning democracy in the sense that can, um, that, that can lead to a sustainable basic income. Important and difficult question of uh, the uh, choice to be made between cash and education. Of course, education is crucial. It's crucial for the, what I call the real freedom that is given to all. Of course, uh, people need to eat. They can't really absorb education if they don't eat. And so basic income, a modest basic income, is simply a, a way of organizing this access to the real basic uh, necessities in a better way than in a means-tested way or by hoping that everyone will get uh, a job uh, paying enough given our present uh, economy. But of course, education is also important. But the education in the 21st century must be thought about in a completely different way from in the past. Education today is not an initial block which you give to adolescents or children, adolescents, young adults, and then they are equipped for life. It's life li lifelong learning in all sorts of ways, using, uh, the, 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 uh, using the, the, your, your smartphones, using... Uh, the internet using this incredible treasure of knowledge, information that is freely available in the internet in a creative and, and critical way. That is the challenge today. That can be very cheap uh, relative to uh, paying uh, professors uh, like you and me and uh, in order to educate people. Give, but it need, you also need some local need my job. to absorb. Uh, fine. Uh, finally... <laughs> Um, yeah, balance between income and, and productivity, if I understand the question. And basic income is really also a way of enabling every person to find the right balance between, um, b between uh, uh, life and uh, contribution to society. But it's certainly not, it should not be seen as a way of telling people you no longer have a duty towards your society. And so... However, whatever form it takes, and for many people it can take a form uh, different from paid labor, it will uh, remain very important. And finally, that will be, there was a question about uh, electronic, the, the possible perverse effect, for example, it may lead to a vertical integration of, uh, of firms in order to, uh, to make uh, big payments across firms uh, less important. But what, and that my final message, I find it so important to broaden, to widen uh, the, uh, the realm of the thinkable. Just think in uh, an open way beyond what is immediately politically possible now. And then some of the ISDs will prove uh, uh, unsustainable. I mean, once you think about it, then you'll see that um, there is something wrong about that. 
what my, uh, my, my, the lesson of my life is really that uh, when you think you have a good idea, one of two things happen, and often both of them. Uh, either you find that after all it's not so good, you discuss about it with your girlfriend, you with your grandmother, and you, discuss, you realize it's not a good idea, you try to forget it, and you try even to forget that you ever had it. Or, uh, but something else happens very often. Uh, it's not that bad an idea, but many other people had it before you. And sometimes the two things happen at the same time. But neither of these two possibilities should prevent us from keeping thinking more widely and we'll, sh we'll transform what is politically possible here and now in Egypt, in Belgium, or anywhere in the world uh, if we think beyond the politically possible. It's, uh, it's that, if they, and I think that's in tune with the, what you are trying to do in the project. Uh, so uh, looking above the clouds should not prevent you from looking where you walk, and so evidence-based policy is uh, important at the same time as a vision for the long term. Thank you so much, Philippe. Uh, uh, this is such uh, uh, an excellent way to close such an informal and close lecture. Thank you. Welcome to Egypt, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you. Shukran al-hudur. Shukran.